All right. Yeah, so this is our last day and there's there's not really new content today. So we're just going to talk about a couple of couple of review ideas and talk about the final a little bit. Let's see. So let's just go ahead and go through some stuff about the final and just try to interrupt me as best you can when you have questions. All right. So the final is cumulative. Uh, it's going to be all the stuff we've done this semester. Uh, and it's not really weighted heavily in, in any direction. So, you know, the, the amount of time we spend in class is about the, you know, proportional amount of time that you should expect to spend on the exam. Um, let's see. It's Wednesday, May 4th. That is, I believe, the very last day of final exams. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to be difficult. You're going to have, you know, we're going to have to, we'll probably get the grades the next night and rush to get them installed into both WebAssign and MyPack portal, uh, by 5 PM on Friday, which is the, the time that they're due. Uh, so let's see. Exam is from 7 to 9.30. It's in the same location that our midterms have been. Note that it does start at 7 this time instead of 7.30. Um, nor normally, normally we start at 7.30 and I kind of ask you to try to come around 7, but now we're starting at 7. So just try to come a little bit before then if you can. Uh, two and a half hours. Um, which is a little less than it normally is. Um, but I, that's okay. What else do we have? Oops. I keep messing up my clicker. Okay, so total number of questions is 28. Um, so if you, you know, divide out the two and a half hours, it's a little over five minutes per question, which is, you know, slightly longer than you would have on a midterm. So that's nice, but it gets better than that. Some of you who've looked at some of the study guides know that, um, the policy for the final is that we're going to grade the best 26 questions out of 28. So it means you can get two wrong and still get 100%. Um, it also means the minimum grade will be a 7%. If you try them and get them all wrong, you know, we sort of give you two for free. Um, there is no way to get above a 100%. This is not an extra credit situation. Let's see, same rules regarding calculators, regarding using the restroom during the exam, which I guess will be more relevant in a two and a half hour exam. Um, so yeah, if you have questions about that, let me know. Um, but I feel, like, I feel like everyone has done a very good job this year, so I'm not too concerned about the rules, um, or this semester, I should say. Let's see. As usual, I'm, I'm really urging you to use the homework as your best review. I think the semester exam, the midterm exams have been very much like the homework. Um, and so using both, the, both of the midterm exams and the homework as your study guide is the best thing you can do, especially uh, I assume most of you have limited time uh, and you need to, you need to budget. Uh, and so if you're trying to be efficient, that's what you do. <clears throat> so there will be a practice test. And I think most of you know by now that the practice test is a little strange all the time uh, in this course. And that's intentional. 
um, because we have some misgivings about how students use practice tests, we try to make the practice test um, sort of obviously not like the test so that you are aware that what you're doing is sort of not the, not the only thing you should be doing. Um, and so it's sort of meant to be extra. It's meant to help you identify things you don't understand. If you really don't have time, uh, I would suggest focusing your attention on reviewing the ex midterm exam questions and the homework more than the practice test. <clears throat> if you have plenty of time, go to the practice test and we'll talk about it. Let's see. Okay, so that's the logistics. Um, does anyone have any questions about the logistics right now? You can, there's probably a few enough people in here that you can just yell out that. All right. Yeah, and you can send me questions by email too, anytime. Physics questions get priority, logistics questions I sometimes forget to answer because <clears throat> they're kind of boring. Um, all right, so here's my plans for what I want to do for review sessions. Uh, this is you know, somewhat open to debate, but I think it's, there's no point in trying to get a, a physical room to do a review. It's just such a headache um, that I don't even want to bother with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep our Monday Zoom chats which we've been doing all semester. And so that's just a two hour block where I sit online and uh, you can come in and talk about whatever you want and you can come in and leave 20 times if you want. You can come in and sit and work on whatever you want and listen, whatever. It's totally up to you. So that'll be on this coming Monday, April 25th and the following Monday, May 2nd, two to 4 p.m. Uh, obviously May 2nd, is a time when probably a lot of people have some exams and okay, I mean, it's not, not much we can do about it. Um, if you have, if you have other questions, I think start with, start with email. And if you have like really extensive questions, we can try to find other individual times. So then I guess I'm going to do two other review sessions. Um, I try to space these in sort of a reasonable way. So uh, I want to do one on Friday, April 29th from 11 a.m. to noon. And so that's in the block that's in between finals time. So even if you do have finals on that day, you know, you should be able to pop in here at least for a minute. And then the same goes for the day of the exam on Wednesday. We'll do 11 a.m. to noon. So that's my plan right now. Um, you know, I think if you if you want to have review and absolutely none of these times can possibly work for you, then please contact me. Uh, you can say it now if you want, or you can send me an email, and we'll try to we'll try to come up with some additional uh, times. What do you think? Questions, comments, concerns. All right. Yeah, this will go really fast if no one wants to talk, which I guess is fine with me. I can go back to coughing more regularly. <laughs> All right. So I guess let's just do an example um, just to remind what we were doing uh, last time. We talked about electromagnetic plane wave propagation, and uh, we basically came up with one special new physical law to describe the geometry of plane wave propagation in a really simple way just by thinking about rays associated with parallel wavefronts. And that was a Snell's law 
So let's do a Snell's Law example and just make a couple of quick comments about it just to kind of just to kind of make sure we spent enough total minutes with that together. So here's a multiple choice question that you might find on an exam. Um, beam of light in vacuum encounters a cover slip and they're giving you the index of refraction of whatever material the cover slip is made of. That seems kind of like plastic or glass to me. N equals 1.46. And it encounters a cover slip at an angle of 40 degrees to the normal of the interface. What will the angle to the normal within the glass be? Okay, I left out a B. Okay, so maybe everybody take, everybody take three minutes and try to work on that. And I will mute myself and set a short timer and see if you can come up with an answer. And so we'll discuss the answer and we'll also discuss some further considerations about this problem. Yeah, I guess if you want to, you can just spam the chat with your with your answer letter. That'll be fun. <laughs> oh my god. It's the Call of Duty lobby. <laughs> I did not plan this, I promise you, but it definitely worked out. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so a lot of people saying F, 
<clears throat> whether it's right or not, you almost have to. Um, but let's 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 see how to do it real quick, and then I guess let's talk about like, um, uh, sort of some elaboration. So, what do I want to do? We'll draw a picture. I think it's important to draw a picture when you're dealing with angles like this, just because you can get mixed up uh, with like where the angles go. Um, so we're coming in from vacuum where n1 equals one and theta one is the angle to the normal of the interface, which is the correct angle here. Theta one is 40 degrees. And so we want to use Snell's law. That's this one. So I'll just start plugging in numbers. So I just plug in one and 1 1.46 and I solve for sine theta two and do the inverse sine. I get 26 degrees. Okay, so not difficult to just plug into Snell's law and this is gonna be pretty common. Like the only difficulty with Snell's law is if you have to do some special trigonometry to to deal with the triangles. But like, let's also take a look here and see if we can figure out like just how to check and make sure. So as we, you know, on average, we have five minutes per problem and we probably don't need a full five minutes to do this one. You know, can we go back and check and make sure that we're right? So a couple things. Number one, since we're going from a low index material to a high index material, we expect the angle to be smaller. So we do expect the, light ray to bend toward the normal. So we can rule out any of these angles that are bigger than 40 degrees. So 59 ruled out, uh, 70 ruled out. 40 is also ruled out because, you know, in order for it to be 40, we would have to have the exact same index of refraction in the two materials. So we rule out three automatically. Uh, let's see, 90 degrees, I suppose is possible that would, well, it's not possible because it's, because it's not smaller. It would, it would be possible if we were going from high to low index. Um, so 36 degrees is possible. We can't rule that out without doing the calculation. So how about zero degrees? I want us to think about zero degrees just for a minute. Um, does anyone have like a thought or a comment about what would it take for us to get zero degrees as our answer in this question? Well, I would say N1 has to equal to, um, I'm sorry, yeah, N1 has to equal to 1.46, right? It has to be the same index, right? I mean, what, but... If it was the same index, what would theta two be? Well, it would have, oh, good point, good point, yeah. that's true. So someone in the chat says n equals zero, which I, yeah, I think you could make that work, but, but let's, um, but let's take a look instead at, at this, analysis that we did with our arithmetic where we got sine theta two is sine 40 over 1.46. So if theta two was zero, right? How would you get sine 40 divided by something to go to zero? So, I mean, the way you could do it is to make the index of refraction go of the second material go to infinity. Right. So if you shot the beam of light in at 40 degrees and you let N2 go to infinity, then sine 40 divided by a really big number is about zero. And so inverse sine would also be zero. So, yeah, unless you've got an effectively infinite second index, you're not going to get zero. So the only two possibilities in here that are actually physically reasonable are D and F. Uh, and so you know, we, we talk about that probably for, yeah, good question. Are there materials that have that high an index? I don't think there's, there's no material. I, well, it's complicated, but um, you can get really high index materials. 
So, um, and I think what you do is you is you nano structure the materials so that their index of refraction is determined by like the the details of the sort of nano structured pillars that you etch into the surface. And that gives you an effective index of refraction that can be very large up to like 40, I think. Um, even though the material you're using doesn't have that high an index, it does when you do the special structuring. So, and I think, and I think this is all, I'm not a super expert in this, but I think this is all related to this issue of, maybe you've heard of like invisibility cloaks. Um, so basically just trying to, trying to bend light around stuff as much as possible as a strategy for sort of making, in fact, they, I don't think they, they usually don't call them cloaks. They usually call them shields, invisibility, sh visibility shields. So you would hold up like a, like a, a shield like object in front of you and it would bend the light coming from behind you all around so that, you know, people wouldn't see you, they would see just the stuff coming from behind you. Anyway, I don't, I don't know a ton about it, but I've definitely seen some stuff. <clears throat> okay, so simple example, like, it, you know, they don't get much harder than this unless you're, I have to do a little bit of trigonometry. <clears throat> All right. Does anyone want to talk more about Snell's law or anything? I'm fine if you do. Like I said, I think we have enough time. And and also if we want, you, you know, after after we finish these slides, I'll I'll stay on this call and people can just talk about whatever. Um I had like a quick thing. Um go ahead. you talked about you talked about like it could get hard with like trigonometry. Would that be like for this example if they said like it comes in at an angle of 50 degrees like to the surface, and then you just have to do like it equals 90 added together that's that's one possibility uh another possibility is like instead of giving you an angle they give you some distances so that would well, that would be one that would be like a little bit more elaborate where it was like oh the light ray um you know comes from a laser that's half a meter away at a height of one meter right and Right, so then you would have to figure out the angle based on the tangent of those two distances. That makes sense. Yeah, so I think you'll have. I think you have at least one homework problem that's kind of in that vein. And again, if you, I think if you're focused on the homework as your guide toward the exam, you'll be you'll you'll be pretty safe. Uh, let's see. There was a question, Vanessa. I think go ahead. If you want. For some for some reason I can't hear you, Vanessa. I can't hear her either. Maybe maybe you don't have a question anymore? She said her mic's like, not working. Uh, She'll yeah. type it in the chat. Okay, sure, go ahead. We have a new professor at NC State. While while Vanessa's typing, I'll tell you, um, Professor Ching Gu is a new professor who is sixty percent electrical engineering and forty percent physics. And she will probably be teaching physics 208 next year. So I guess all of you won't get her. Or I hope all of you won't get her. <laughs> hope you make it through. Uh, but she works on photonic materials where she, where she, you know, invents and nanostructures new materials to try to manipulate light. I don't necessarily know that she's working on invisibility type technology, but but uh, she does a lot of really interesting things. <clears throat> she just she just arrived this semester and she's building her lab over the course of the next six months to a year. <clears throat> How much money does that cost? Oh, new lab. Um, you know, 
it's definitely above a half a million and i would suspect it's it's close to a million dollars yeah so where did you get the funding from when nc state hires a new professor uh to do research like that they provide the startup funding so yeah nc that's one of the biggest budget issues for nc state is figuring out how to you know pay a million dollars per researcher to set up you know state-of-the-art new labs yeah so vanessa asks if n is always one in a vacuum answer to that is absolutely yes if it's vacuum it's one if it's air it's pretty much one as well um it's 1.0002 or something. And then if the material type given matters, like we have questions that involve assumptions about the material on the exam. Um, let's see. I Material type definitely matters. Um, but I'm not sure that there's any assumption that it would be valid to ask you to make. So may, maybe you could slightly clarify that. Um, so let's see, like, for example, are you thinking of like insulator versus conductor or something like that? Um, you know, I think conductors have really complicated indices of refraction and they really don't let light through much anyway. So I wouldn't worry about that. So yeah, if, if you want to clarify, uh, I'll pay attention. So like, for example, are you expected to remember that glass has a higher index of refraction than water? The answer is no. Um, that's, you know, we're not asking you to memorize different numbers and it's, you know, I think, I think you would be expected to know that any material would have to have an index that's bigger than or equal to one. Like it couldn't be less than one, right? And so if it's any type of material, it's at least a little bit bigger than one. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so we can come back to this, uh, you know, at the end today or, or you know, later on in review sessions. Um, but for now, I guess I'll go, I wanna just go through uh, and tell you about this, this video and sort of use it as a vehicle to remind you of some things that have gone on in this class throughout the semester. <clears throat> Let's see, doggone it. Yeah, so here's a, here's a thumbnail of the video on, this came out a few months ago from a, a fairly famous science YouTuber name. The channel name is Veritasium. Um, very, very good channel. Um, I'm going to make some criticisms of this video, but hopefully I'll also say some positive things. So it's not a complete, it's not a complete drag. Um, but here's a top, top comment on the video is, I'm so glad this video exists. I used to not complete, I used to completely not even understand how electricity worked and now I still don't. So I think that may actually also apply to this class, which I mean, I, you know, the truth is nature is complicated and it takes a long time to feel comfortable with how it works. One class is never gonna do it. <clears throat> okay. So big misconception about electricity is that energy doesn't flow in wires. So that's clickbait, right? Because everyone's like, what? Of course it does. Stuff flows in wires. All right. So here are the good points of this video. The reason this video is made, and I think you can all kind of get on board with that from this class, is that Veritasium wants to make the point that electromagnetic fields are so important. And moreover, they can transport energy right? Fields, fields exert forces on charges. And so if, if, if there are fields, you know, energy is sort of being moved through space in some sense, right? And that's a really important point to make. And it's one of the points of this course. 
And along the way, Veritasium's video makes a lot of good points about power transmission and how field distributions look in circuits in both DC and AC situations. I'll focus on DC today because in this class, we're not talking much about AC, um, if at all. I think we didn't really talk about it at all. And then another thing that we also don't talk about in this class, but you know, in PY208 in the past, sometimes we do, is Veritasium gives us actually a good introduction to something called the pointing vector, which describes energy flow in electromagnetic fields and in radiation. And the pointing vector is uh, basically E cross B with a proportionality constant, which you also know is sort of like the propagation speed. Um, <clears throat> so it's a that's a an interesting topic that you might come back to later on in your studies. So what are the bad points? I think the bad points of this video, the number one for me is that, you know, the idea that you want to de-emphasize the role of wires in controlling the electric and magnetic fields is not well motivated. They are at, wires are absolutely essential. Uh, and so that's, that's the main point of my critique. And of course, a lot of other people on YouTube have taken the opportunity to make critiques of this. It's a good way to get some views. Um, another bad point is there are some sort of sneaky assumptions about how light bulbs work, which are basically wrong. And I guess, you know, you could overlook that if there weren't any other bad points, but um, it is important to realize that. Number three, for me, like it's, it's you know, the statement that energy doesn't flow in wires is sort of just wrong on its face because stuff is flowing, right? Like charge is actually moving. Charges are colliding with the lattice with each other. And it, the most important thing is like the charges as they move are the things that are creating the fields. And so it's absolutely true that the fields are important to energy flow but the fields come from the charges. And so decoupling them is not a wise choice um, in my mind. And then there's one point in the video where there's a discussion of irreversible energy transfer to loads and specifically like a toaster. And that's a pretty bad discussion that I think uh, should probably have been edited out. So that's my, my hot takes on the video. And now, now I'll try to provide some evidence based on stuff that we did in the class to, to um, emphasize these points. So this is the setup. Veritasium wants us to build a really big, simple circuit where we have a light bulb, a battery, and a switch. And we connect the light bulb to the battery and switch by really long wires. So each wire um, has a length of one light second. So there's half a light second from here to here and about half a light second the rest of the way around. And so what is a light second? I just want to do that little calculation real quick. Because the speed of light is a universal constant, we can use it to set up a distance scale, right? Because in a fixed time, light will always travel the same distance. And so a distance of a half a light second is the distance that light travels in a half a second. And so that distance is the speed of light times half a second, which is 1.5 times 10 to the seventh. No, it's 1.5 times 10 to the eighth. I messed that up. Oops. Maybe I won't bother fixing it. Hopefully you can all see that. I was going to fix the typo, but maybe I just won't. It should be 1.5 times 10 to the eighth. But it's so it's a long distance, right? It's a huge, huge distance. And so the question that Veritasium wants us to ask is set up like a multiple choice question. And this is why I say it's like, so PY208, right? Because like, would you get this question on a PY208 exam? And so the question 
that he asks is, when we close the switch, how long does it take the light bulb to light up? And so the options are half a second. So that would be the time it takes for light to travel from the switch down the wire to the bend, more or less. One second, so that would be all the way around, more or less. Two seconds would be double. One over C seconds? Hmm. Or none of the above. Okay, and so Veritasium is clear about two assumptions that he wants to make. The first one is that the wires have no resistance. I mean, that's obviously false, but it's something that I would absolutely be willing to just accept as you could make the resistance of the wires negligible somehow, some way. Uh, Dr. Darty. Yeah, go ahead. Um, are you sharing this? Or, or, Am I not sharing start? it? Yeah, no. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Something happened and I stopped sharing. Yeah, let me go back. Yeah, I, I guess I must have stopped sharing when I when I tried to fix my typo. Sorry about that. Yeah. So here are the here are the assumptions. So these are these are the multiple choice questions, right? So let me just point them out again. So a half a second, right? Roughly like the speed of light going down one leg. One second would be going around the whole bend. Two seconds would be like twice. One over C seconds is a little bit unclear, but it's very short if C is three times 10 to the 80 meters per second or none of the above, right? And so I'm not gonna try to play a game here. Like Veritasium is doing the whole YouTube thing and he wants people to engage with this and like type their answer in the comments. The answer that Veritasium wants us to pick is one over C seconds, okay? And we're gonna talk about why there's, you know, why that's okay the way he set the problem up, but why it's also a little bit misleading. Okay, so he wants us to pick D but the truth is probably E, it's probably somewhere between B and C, I guess. So the assumptions are wires have no resistance and that the light bulb turns on immediately. And the thing that, the thing that he doesn't say with his own voice, but, with, but which I wanna emphasize to you is what by immediately he means when any current passes through it at all, right? And that's a sort of flaw in the whole setup in that, you know, if you put a teeny tiny current through a light bulb, it's not going to light up, right? You put 10 to the minus 15 amps through, it's not doing anything, all right? <clears throat> but that's sort of key to the whole setup is that it turns on immediately if it has any current flowing through it. There are some unstated assumptions, and that is that there's no capacitance associated with any of the circuit elements. So, you know, a battery separates charge across plates, and there's probably a tiny capacitance associated with it. Um, you know, we've got current loops here that might have some Faraday's law type uh, EMFs, uh, and that would be referred to as an inductance in a lumped parameter. And so we assume there's nothing related to that happening. And again, we're also, we're sort of assuming that steady state is not necessary. And, you know, in most um, circuit problems, you really are thinking about the steady state. Like that's why you build the circuit is you, you know, you design the circuit to control the steady state behavior because that's what's going to be stable and usable, like for an end user, right? And Veritasium is definitely not interested in us thinking about the steady state. <clears throat> Wait, let's go back. All right, so why does light bulb light up? Let's just remind some things. Um, in our matter and interactions textbook, Shabai and Sherwood um, point out to us that a light bulb is just a thin wire. So we got thick, thick wires coming from a battery and then a really thin wire that's the filament of the light bulb. 
And so what happens is you push the same amount of current through this whole circuit, but inside the thin part of the circuit, the resistance is very high. And the resistance is sort of coming from collisions between the uh, mobile charges and the fixed pieces of the lattice. And those collisions transfer energy. Uh, and what that basically does is heat the solid up. It makes the, makes the vibrational motion of the solid uh, have a higher amplitude. And so since you've got vibrational motion, that basically looks like a little microscopic antenna and that's going to emit electromagnetic radiation. So that's sort of the, the reason we're lighting things up is basically we transfer energy from the mobile carriers, at least in part, to the lattice. Uh, and that's what makes the light. So if you want to learn more about, you know, like why, why a hot filament looks a certain color. Uh, the next physics class that you would take after this one is usually PY407 or PY203. PY203 is for physics majors mostly, but you can take it if you want. Uh, and they'll talk about black body radiation and you get sort of an idea for why, why hot solids look the way they do. And it requires quantum mechanics to get it right. Okay. So already to me, this is suggesting that there's a little bit of a, of a misdirection in saying that energy is not transported in wires because you know, if that were true, it wouldn't really make sense that we, could, that we could have these types of processes where we heat up the wire. Let's go back to the question. So when we close the switch, how long does it take for the light bulb, not light bulk to light up, All right? And so we basically need to figure out how long does it take for there to be a current in the filament, right? And in order to have a current, we need to have an electric field. And so we wanna think about the ways in which we can get electric fields in PY208, right? So we need to know what E fields are present in the circuit, what B fields are present, and can they all drive currents through the bulb? Because the idea is if there's any field at all, in other words, any current at all, the light bulb turns on immediately. And so I, I took one of our favorite pictures from back before test two, just to show some of the fields that come up in a circuit like this. So this is an example where we've got this uh, funny little Shebang Sherwood mechanical battery and we're sort of showing how we get surface charges along the wire to establish the uniform electric field inside the wire. And so that's this picture uh, that's a glow script simulation from Shebe. <clears throat> All right. So that's a, that's a type of E field that we can get in a circuit that we know about. And in fact, take a look at Veritasium's video at the you know six six minute fifty second mark, you can see Veritasium pointing out that indeed there are surface charges that create the uniform E field that drives the conventional current in the direction of the uniform E field. Right. So this is great, right? Like if you watch this video, I guarantee you, almost every word out of this person's mouth, you will be like, oh yeah, we talked about that in PY two hundred eight. It's a, it's a good video and he's a very good presenter. So minor critique of this picture. What should the minor critique of this picture be? Somebody, somebody give me, give me a, it's, you know. Is it uh, the distribution of surface charge? Yeah, be more specific though. Uh, okay. Um, I not mean, not infinitely that. more specific, just. I mean, it can't be like all positive charges like that, like constant, you know what I mean? It, it yeah, constant. right. It, and so the way it's drawn in this cartoon, Veritasium is suggesting that the surface charge is uniform. In other words, like per unit surface area of the wire, it's the same amount of coulombs. And that can't be right. 
what we what we learned from Shibay and Sherwood, which is one of their one of their most uh, what's the word unique discussion points, is that the surface charge distribution needs to have a gradient. So what I'm showing you in this glow script snapshot is red is relatively positive and blue is starting to get negative, right? And so you need to go from deep red to faint red to pink to blue in order to get there to be a field that's pushing in one direction inside the wire. So this internal field is the thing that drives the conventional current, again, inside the wire, right? So something is definitely moving inside the wire. And so there's definitely some amount of energy transfer. Like it's impossible to refute that. Um, so yeah, that, but that's a relatively minor point because I think, I think that's actually uh, the idea that you need a surface charge gradient is something that we all know in this class, but that might be difficult to grasp for people who are not taking a class in this topic. <clears throat> Just to go back, let me let me remind you how that looks, right? When we look at this circuit diagram, which I took directly from your textbook, the surface gradient is being indicated by the number of plus symbols as you move along the wire. So there's a lot at point one, there's fewer at point two, and there's fewer and fewer as you move to point three, where it's almost neutral. And then you go a little bit of negative up to higher negative. So that's what I mean by surface charge gradient. And that's, a, that's an important review topic from this class. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, so that, that wouldn't really make me super mad to see a cartoon like this, because even just sort of understanding that the surface charge is present is a good, a good piece of knowledge to pass along. So then Veritasium draws this cartoon, which is really great. And so in this case, uh, he's trying to indicate the fields created by the surface charges outside the wire. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> um, and so these red lines are all electric field lines. So remember, we introduced that in our discussion of, of radiation. Um, so they're not... at not actually drawing the vectors here, just sort of the general direction of the fields, which is important to keep in mind as we go forward. Because when you look at this picture, you can see the pattern of field directions, but you don't get a real sense for the magnitude of the field. Um, and that could be significant in understanding in actual fact, whether the light bulb would light up. But it is good that you see at the positive terminal it being positive and at the negative terminal it being negative. And we would add to this that there must be a gradient, right? High negative here, low negative here, high positive here, low positive there. And, you know, because of that, this field distribution is a little bit wrong, right? It can't be perfectly symmetric because of the gradient. <clears throat> Dr. Doherty. Um... Go ahead. Wouldn't there be like a lot of uh, surface charge pileup between the bulb, right? Because of the resistor, right? You know what I mean? Uh, so yeah, very, so that's actually a really good point. So um, yeah, what would happen if we would actually draw the bulb as Shibay and Sherwood want us to think about a bulb, which is just a more narrow segment of wire? And so you're absolutely right. What would happen is there would be a very high surface charge gradient along the wire that's part of the bulb. Um, so that's a point that I didn't think of until you just brought it up. So uh, good point. You score, you score a point against Veritasium in this discussion. So let's see, I don't, I don't have a picture with that in front of me right now to show everybody what you mean, but like it's in your textbook. If you look at that thing where you've got a big fat wire that goes down to a little skinny wire, right? The, char the surface charge density gradient is much higher in the skinny part of the wire. 
because the field needs to be larger, right? And this is something that you're expected to be able to analyze quantitatively based on um, the stuff, I guess, from chapter uh, 18 and 19. All right, good point. Yeah, so there are, there are problems with this. It's not, to me, this is not the end of the world. It's, it's a somewhat simplified view of field patterns outside of uh, a circuit. What's next? Go ahead. Do you think that the, the guy who made the video, do you think he intentionally did that to simplify it? Or do you think, you know, he actually, you know, thinks? So? Uh, you know, I, don't, I guess I don't want to speculate too much. I'm 100% sure that Veritasium chose to make simplifications. I mean, you have to. You're making a 15-minute video for, you know, a, a very broad population of viewers. Um, yeah, so I, I do think there's definitely, there's definitely a willful disregard for what is a light bulb here, right? And I think the harder you think about what a light bulb is, the more this analysis in the video starts to break down, right? Both from the standpoint of why is it glowing and from the standpoint of what is the actual field distribution around the light bulb. <clears throat> Okay, but let's keep going because this, once we've set up those E fields, we've got now a steady state current flowing. And if you've got a steady state current flowing in this circuit, you've got a Biot-Savar type current right-hand rule magnetic field. So the blue circles are the field lines, not the field vectors, but the field lines associated with the B field around this circuit as current flows through it. And so this is a pretty good view. Like if you, if you ignore all the issues related to gradients uh, in the wire and gradients in the bulb, this is more or less what the field pattern would look like around a circuit. But there's a key to this diagram that veritasium is not really um, letting the audience know about, which is this is steady state, right? When we talk about our surface charge distributions in PY208, right, that whole idea that we rearrange the surface charge to get a uniform internal E field to drive a steady conventional current, that basically says we've gone to steady state conditions. We've let all the transients in this circuit die out, right? And everything has settled down. Um, and so this is a decent picture of field patterns, but it's a decent picture, picture of field patterns if you assume the circuit has reached steady state. And that's explicitly inconsistent with the answer that Veritasium wants us to choose. He wants us to choose one over C, but one over C is 100% not steady state. And so it's basically irrelevant to this field pattern. So that's one of, one of my critiques of, uh, of the video. So let's do a little more analysis. So what answer does he want us to say? I already told you. He wants us to choose D, one over C seconds. So let me tell you why he wants us to choose that. Some of you may kind of see it. So the idea is that when you close the switch, the charges in the wire were initially at zero drift speed. And when you close the switch, they get accelerated, right? And so let's say you accelerate a charge this way, right? At that instant that it gets this acceleration, it immediately produces a pulse of electromagnetic radiation, where E rad is this little kink direction that's pointing opposite to the A perpendicular, which is the full arrow. And we're gonna look, our observation direction is gonna be toward the bulb, right? So obviously radiation is going off everywhere when you accelerate that charge, but let's look in the direction toward the bulb. And let's note that in that direction, A vector equals A perpendicular. And so then that 
irradiation pulse, right, which will be parallel to the wire direction, is propagating at the speed of light, right? And of course, it's only got a meter to travel before it gets to the light bulb, even though there's a huge distance of circuit that it hasn't ever probed. And so this is the idea that Veritasium wants us to take seriously, is that when you flip this shut, you get an accelerated charge that makes radiation. And so even if this is a teeny tiny field that makes a teeny tiny current, because the light bulb is supposed to turn on for any current whatsoever, this should be enough to satisfy uh, his particular setup and make D be the supposed right answer. So yeah, this idea that we're gonna use this formula, once we've got that E, there will be some current flowing in the bulb wire. And we assume that whatever that current is, it's enough to light it up, which is probably not true as a practical matter. So let's just say what he actually means by one over C seconds. Right? It's the time for this pulse to reach the bulb. So distance equals speed times time. We need to go one meter at the speed of light, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. And so the time that that would actually take is one over C where the one should have units of meters. C is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And so you get three times 10 to the minus nine seconds, which is three nanoseconds, okay? So that's the time it takes to get a radiation pulse from down here to up here. And so it's, yeah, go ahead. Um, is the size of the battery going to impact how fast the acceleration is? What do you mean by size? Like if you use like a, a bigger battery, is the acceleration gonna be greater? You mean more voltage? Yes, I'm sorry, yes, more voltage. Uh, for sure, for sure. But I think because of the way he set this up where it doesn't matter, as long as there's any current at all, the size of the battery is irrelevant. Okay. If you watch some of the other reaction videos to the Veritasium video, you'll see people deal with this in even more detail than I am about like why uh, that this assumption that the light bulb turns on immediately is really self-defeating because in this case, even with the switch open, you can make an argument that there would be some leakage current through the switch. And so the light bulb would always be on and the answer would be zero seconds. So it's, but anyway, I, you know, I think that's a, that's an overly practical critique in my opinion. I think it's, it's reasonable to pretend that there exists a perfect switch in the world. <clears throat> All right, I wanna keep going just a few more minutes with this, where am I? Yeah, the key assumption is that any amount of field is sufficient to drive a current that will light up the bulb, right? And so it sort of lets the answer D be considered correct, despite the fact that there are many, many objections to the setup. <clears throat> but here's my, for me, the most important objection goes like this, right? Um, the field configuration at three nanoseconds is not the steady state when you're dealing with wires that are this long, right? Three nanoseconds, only a really small part of the circuit will see the steady E and B fields that we drew earlier. So something like this, right? About a meter to either side, the rest of the circuit doesn't even know that the switch has been closed, right? There's no current, there's no fields. Current makes B fields. Charge, surface charge makes E fields. And none of those have been rearranged on these other parts of the circuit. So there's no way you can get to steady state. And there's no way you're gonna really be able to push enough current to light up a light bulb without being at least close to a steady state. <clears throat> um, so this is, I think, the, the main objection is that, yes, if that little pulse of radiation can light the light bulb, fine. But the truth is it can't. The truth is you've only, you've only dealt with this little tiny piece of the circuit and you, you, know, you need to propagate uh, along the circuit. 
a little bit longer to see the, the bulb light up and act normal. And so this is just a reminder of what do we mean by steady state. Um, so yeah, Rachel is asking in the chat, is, is this the main argument that Veritasium makes when they say energy doesn't flow through a wire? Yeah, I think that I think yeah, the point that they're trying to make is that energy is really flowing through the fields, and that's an important argument to make. And I agree that that's important. Um, but it's also really important to say that the wires control the fields, and I think I think those two things are equally important. And my objection to this video is that veritasium. Um, denigrates the role of the wire too much like if you don't have this wire none of this is working um in reality yeah so right that but that is indeed the point and it is a very important and valid point that energy flows in fields right and one of the reasons we have the wire is to control the way the fields behave all along this length Right, and make the circuit a controllable object that, that we can deal with. What else we got? Wait, have I clicked something wrong? Yeah, so my argument is to reach steady state. I mean, that's not really my argument. It's sort of obvious. Um, it's it's going to be more like a full second, probably more than a full second for the impact of closing the switch to propagate at basically the speed of light along this whole length of wire. So we've got surface charges rearranging, we've got currents creating B fields, and it takes a half a second to go down here and another half a second to go down there. And the truth is it probably takes a little bit of extra time because stuff is happening at not, maybe not quite the speed of light. <clears throat> So here's my summary of what I want to say. Veritasium's video is great. Like I, I'm not actually like mad about it, or, or um, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to say don't watch it or or unsubscribe to that channel. Uh, it has a ton of valuable insight. Like again, almost every word out of his mouth in that video is really interesting. And there's there's only one thing he says that I think is like legitimately wrong, and that's about the the irreversible energy transfer stuff, uh, if you've seen it. But, but yeah, the bad part for me is I think if you were watching this, and especially if you're a student where a lot of your life is tied up in like, what's the right answer and how do I make sure I you know keep my GPA high, right? That one over C is really extremely open to debate. And I think the, the good part about the video is that there's a ton of discussion around it. Like you can make a case that under certain assumptions, one over C could be the right answer. And that's what Veritasium has done. But then at the same time, I would not have set that up as a multiple choice question. Um, I would, uh, or I would have set it up with uh, one of the options being, it depends on your assumptions, right? And I would then have discussed all the different assumptions, uh, which I think are really super interesting and worth thinking about. Yeah, so my, you know, I think the the now the truth is it takes a lot longer for strong enough fields to get set up in such a big circuit. <clears throat> and again, I like a matter and interactions perspective, and I think the correct perspective is yes, the fields are so important. You must you know, you must raise the fields up on a pedestal. They transport energy, they transport energy rapidly, but the charges in the wires are the sources of the fields. And so you really don't want to be like, oh, wires don't matter, right? That's a, that's a little bit, that's a little bit over the top. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. I felt like there was something I, I quickly wanted to say. Uh, maybe not. Maybe I forgot it. All right, I think that's all I wanted to say today. We're, I guess we're not super early. Sorry about that. I thought we'd be a lot earlier. Um, 
I thought everybody would get a small break today, but yeah, I'll, I'll hang around here. I mean, I've got another class to teach in a couple minutes. Um, you can stay, you can stay uh, as long as you want. Um, we can, we can chat about other stuff now. I have a question about logistics. I forgot to ask. Yeah, go ahead. Um, like 205, the final exam, they threw a couple questions that were I want to say more challenging, like kind of like multi-step problems, combining concepts and stuff. And um, the answer choices were also harder. Is that how the final exam for 208 is going to be? Or? I mean, I, it's really hard for me to give a, my opinion about that because, yeah, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to have a couple of challenging problems. And in particular, right, you get, you get two wrong for free. Right. So, so even if there are some super challenging ones, you know, you have some, you have some grace. So, so I, I you know, we, it's not unreasonable for there to sort of be some problems that are meant to distinguish between, you know, A and A plus. I think if I say more, I'll probably just end up misleading people. Right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, we'll, we'll definitely see you at the final exam. Um, it, it's been a nice semester. I appreciate everybody, you know, rolling with the punches. Thank you. Bye bye. Hey there. Um, I wanted to know if I have uh, three exams on May 4th. I sent in the um, thing on my pack and I filled out the form, but I <laughs> haven't really gotten any response for when I would be uh -huh. able to take it. Yeah, Rupin, I reckon. Is that, is that you talking, Rupin? Yeah, it's me. Okay, good. Um, I do remember your name. Everything is in order with your uh, you know, I think right now we're just trying to figure out how to schedule it. And I don't know where we are with that. We have to collect all the different people from all the, so you filled out your availability in the online form. Yeah. Yeah. I so, told which days I have exams. Yeah. So what we're trying to do right now is just organize all of that because we, you know, we sort of can't do every individual person individually. So we're trying to get at least groups that can go together. Um, so my recommendation to you is, you know, we, I, I can't tell you anything right now. Um, I would say, you know, keep checking in. You're going to hear something soon. Um, no one's going to get mad at you for checking on it, but we don't know anything right now. Okay. Well, that's. I was just wondering if I missed something. Or... You you haven't missed anything, but it's good to check in periodically. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Bye. Yeah, I just want to say thank you. Yep. I really I really appreciate your class this semester. You actually explained everything in a way that made sense. Like you taught the material. Thanks. Um, it's I nice feel like to that, hear that. Yeah. I, <laughs> I don't know. I didn't really have that experience too great last semester, so I was really glad that you were okay. able to like make it a physical, like you explain everything, you answer our questions. You, I like how it was open. Like, hey, if you have a question, just quickly mm -hmm. raise a hand or even just, just go ahead and say it. Like, I really appreciate yeah. that. All right. Thanks for telling right. me. Yeah. Take Talk care. Talk to you later. Yep. Yeah. Bye. Bye.